this video will be recorded and posted on facts. Um, and you can have it accessible if you'd like to go back to review any of the information or um, to send it to um, your significant other. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Mrs. Martinez, who will begin um, with a prayer. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming uh, and for joining us this morning. We're going to go ahead and start with prayer as we start with all things. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today's reading is from Matthew 15. Then his disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He said in reply, every plant that my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. If a blind, ma blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Jesus teaches us to reach out, to love boldly, to sacrifice, and to be light and salt for the earth. He also teaches us to let go. It can be hard to respect people's freedom, and it can be distressing to let people live with their mistakes. But we love, we do what we can, and we pray. As hard as it is, we might just have to listen in sorrow and acceptance to Jesus's words here. Let them alone. And God, we just ask for your intervention in all things and your guidance to help us know how to best move forward in every decision that we make, always keeping in mind our children and the community that we love so much. We ask this through Christ's name, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, we really just wanted to be able to share with you um, a few kind of overarching ideas about where, um, where our process has been and how we made these decisions, and then to answer any questions that you may have. Um, in some of them, we may not know the answer to yet, um, and so we'll be sure to go back and get those answers for you. And some of them um, we have definitely thought of, but just haven't put it out there yet. So we want to let you know we're happy to answer any of those questions as well and to to get us ready uh, for this really new and exciting way of of learning and and what education is going to be looking like in 2020. So the first thing that I want to say to each of you is that in every decision that we have made over the last six months, um, safety has been our driver. We want to make sure that our program is safe for everyone. That means for the students that we have before us, it means for the faculty and staff that we have on our campus. And of course, we wanna do everything we can to keep your family safe as well. Because the truth be told at the end of the day, all of these children, they go back home to you and they bring everything to you. And that means everything they've been exposed to. And we know how that works in education, that children bring home all kinds of stories and all kinds of exciting adventures to you about their day. And we wanna make sure that everything we do can be brought home to you safely in all of this. We also understand the importance of face-to-face -face instruction, especially for early childhood. Not for a minute do we believe that distance learning is the way to go for early childhood children, but it may be the way we need to go for a time being, and we wanna make sure that we respect both of those routes and really help students to have a great learning experience, whether it's the comfort and safety of your home or whether it's from the comfort and safety of your school community. So that's really how we helped, uh, how it helped us to guide these, in, these decisions. And of course, lastly, we listen to you all. Um, thank you so much for taking part in the surveys and letting us know what your thoughts are and what your needs are and your concerns, because it really helped us to see what we needed to do to create a really safe and, um, and fun and exciting and educational program 
for, for our students and for your children. And I think that's such an important thing. Um, when you look, um, even if you just look at the four of, of us here at the office on this screen, you will see we have a we have a wide range of of children we're missing one of our team members miss flores this morning as she's caring for her dad um, but between the five of us on this administration staff we have children uh, ranking from one year old. Um, I think Ms. Flores might have the oldest at close to 30. So we have children of all different ages and we always wanna make sure that we're doing what's best for each of those children. I think one thing that really, um, I, I heard this the other day and I really want this to um, help our families who have been with us for a while. And that is to know that whatever your experience was last year um, with St. Anne's and, and with, with learning, that I would say to you was not distance learning. That is crisis learning. And I really do believe that everything we did during that time it was to keep us moving from the status through the status quo but we've had all summer and our teachers our faculty and staff in particular have worked tirelessly to make sure that we have a really formidable distance learning plan that's ready for your students it will not look um, or it will look very different than what you may have seen last year. Some of it may involve more learning. Some of it may involve less of other things as we recognize that they really were not that beneficial. And so I really want to encourage you to, um, to help us do the same. Take the good of what came out of last year's crisis learning, but then be ready for a very different distance learning plan this semester. So before we get too far into it, I want to make sure just that you have an understanding of where our distance learning plan comes from this year. And the, and the first is just to make sure that everybody has a very clear understanding of the two definitions in particular of synchronous and asynchronous learning. Uh, they're definitely buzzwords in education. They're not words we used very frequently before March 13th of last year, but now they seem to be a part of our everyday vocabulary. So I don't know, your four-year-olds may soon be saying something about asynchronous and synchronous, and, and you'll know that they have a, an expanded vocabulary. So the synchronous instruction is what's referred to when we're talking about live instruction. That's when it's, a, it's a, something just like this. You're on a screen and you are watching and a child is, is learning with a teacher who is teaching them right now. It's not like our business office meeting. So for those of you who have had to live through um, hours and hours of Zoom meetings on call at work, that's not what synchronous instruction is like. Synchronous instruction has teachers sharing their screens, have, has teachers asking kids questions, asking them to respond, asking them to do some work while they are watching or listening. So it's a very um, involved process. And obviously our teachers are, um, have been learning to be prepared for anything that can happen during synchronous instruction. And I think that's especially the case with early childhood. I will share with you, I don't think it's ideal for early childhood for a very long period of time. And that's why we're working so hard to make sure that we get back to face-to-face -face instruction as soon as we can. We know that at the early childhood level, the most important thing for our children to learn is how to be social beings. And part of that means interacting with other people not a computer screen. So we want to make sure that when the teachers are presenting synchronous instruction, the kids are really engaged with the teacher. They're talking, they're doing things, they're showing their work so that we can go through this. But our ideal would be to be back in face-to-face -face instruction. 
The second part of that definition is asynchronous instruction. And you probably received a lot of that last year. That's where the teacher is recording a lesson. She, may be, she or he may be recording a video or a full lesson that involves videos and then time for the student to stop um, watching the screen move away from the screen, do some actual work to the side. Maybe they're painting something, maybe they are um, you know, creating something. That's the asynchronous learning. We will spend most of our time with our ancillary teachers in asynchronous instruction. Um, that should probably be a definition that many people understand too. Ancillary teachers are our art, music, physical education, um, Spanish, technology, those kinds of classes that your child takes, those are gonna be the, the courses that we do a lot of asynchronous instruction. So the teacher is going to record a lesson for the children. They're going to watch the lesson. They can watch it at the time that we should be in distance learning, or they can watch it at a time that's more convenient for you, and then they're going to do the work that's beside it, okay? Um, one of the things I would also say to you, a, a big difference on all of this is, um, is how we're going to assess the work. We talked about that last year we were in a crisis mode. There wasn't a lot of assessment going on. There was a lot of just do the work and let's get through it. But this year, we really wanna focus on the students being able to show the teachers their work and the teachers being able to give feedback on that work and help them move on to the next level. Because I do believe we still have an obligation and we take that obligation very seriously to be moving your children through an early childhood education program. We just know it's gonna look a little different this year. And then the last definition that I think is really important for you um, as families to know is the term a cohort. And for the most part, um, a lot of times a cohort is our regular homeroom. And in an early childhood classroom, more than ever, it is. For, this, um, for these first few weeks of school, that cohort is going to be those groups of students who are together either on Monday and Tuesday or on Thursday and Friday. And I know the burning question many of you have is when are you going to get those cohorts? They're ready and we are going to be um, having, we're gonna send those out to you on Thursday, okay? So um, give us just a couple days to really run them through the teachers. Miss Cole has been uh, taking care of those cohorts and it was her priority along with the teachers to make sure those cohorts were balanced boys and girls, make sure they were balanced from there. If you have a, a burning reason that you need one day, you know, one set of days more than the other, please just let Ms. Cole know that because the earlier we can fix those, the, the better. But if it doesn't matter to you and that's okay, then, then please let us use our best judgment on, on how to get those cohorts scheduled, okay? Those cohorts are really, we're really expecting those to, um, I should say we are hoping those cohorts are going to last us through September 8th. And our hope is that the numbers and everything else in the city is looking better, that we will be able to move to full five day a week instruction after September the 8th. Um, that's, that's our goal and that's what we're working towards. Those first two weeks of being in the cohort are really to give us a little bit of time to get through the safety measures and to make sure we have an understanding of how we want to do all this and to be able to do it without all 500 kids on campus. If we can start with a small number and really work out the, the kinks in the program, we want to be able to do that um, in a very safe environment. So that's what we're aiming for. Um, I've definitely seen some questions about out there about what would change that date. Um, at this point, what would change that date is a directive um, from the governor or from the cardinal. So those are the two things that we are we're holding holding forward from on this 
at this point. Um, so just, just, I hope that's a little bit of information from, from there. Okay. I'm gonna, yeah, Danielle. <laughs> Would you like to um, start with questions? Sure. Okay. Um, Ms. Hartman asked, um, when all the students join campus in September, will they join in cohort groups twice a week and pre-K continues cohort groups or will the older grades uh, join back in September and everyone goes full time? I, I believe you pretty much covered that. We'll transition back to having um, a majority of the students in the, in the classroom five days a week, right? That's correct. Um, another big question, um, and it's pretty exciting for our campus because we're introducing a new, a new vendor to campus, iKidsU, and I'm going to um, have Ms. Cole answer this question. She's been our main um, administrative liaison with the company and has a little bit more of the details, um, but primarily Mr. Foles wants to know if, if aftercare will be available for early childhood while the rest of the school is distance learning, and then maybe you can give us a little bit more about the company. Hey everyone, so great to see all of your faces um, or just your names for those who don't have the video. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to bring iKids on. So iKids is honestly right down the street, right here on West Alabama. And I've been talking to them a lot and kind of getting to know more about the program and what they've been doing and what they are doing in other schools. Um, I can share with you that um, they are, have been working diligently and their center has stayed open as soon as the stay home um, ordinance was lifted. And so they have their center there in West Alabama. And so they have kind of gone through all the trials and errors of how to make sure they keep their, their kids who are going to the center safe. So they open for essential workers at that point. Um, so yeah, they're going to be on campus. It's going to run Similarly to how our after school program ran, um, the really main difference is it being outsourced. So to Mr. Fultz's question, we are hoping that yes, it will be available as soon as August 24th, right? I believe that's today. As soon as August 24th comes, um, they, will, they will be here on campus to support our families um, who have an early childhood um, student as well as an older student as well as just those who just have early childhood students. Um, really we're just in the logistics of it all, the paperwork side of it on our side. So we have to get the agreement signed, look at the liability and all of that. And then they are preparing the registration documents on their end. So once we have the paperwork ready to go, then the registration document and the parent letter, letter that kind of outlines the fees and all of that will be sent to our community. Um, what else can I tell you? So they have been, um, so the lady I've been working with, her name is Lois, and she has, she's so wonderful that, she, you know, anytime I have a question, I just shoot her a text or an email, and she will be the one here to help us roll out the program on our campus. So if you have any specific questions, she has given me the, the um, right to kind of give you her email address. Um, and she's also been kind of in the know of what our plan is here on campus to roll out our back to school, um, back to school plan. So a little bit about them, right? What, what they call it is stay and play. So what they do is it's basically their ratio is one to 10. Okay, and we are working on keeping the students in those same cohorts. So if my son comes Monday and Tuesday and he is with six of the kids and those four of those six have to stay for aftercare, then we are trying to keep them in that same cohort. That's just kind of to help with the, you know, um, any, any possible contamination or anything like that. So we're really working on that. So it's called Stay and Play. And they are, um, they are basically here to supervise your child, play with them, um, provide any assistance for their older kids. Um, as far as homework, anything like that, they'll do that. But it, it does run very similarly to, our, to what was our after school program. Do you see any questions? Anything I could have um, talked about? No, I think that covers it. Um, we, when should parents um, expect to see a few more details about registration and whatnot within the next week or so? I would say within, the, she just texted me. Um, she said they are, their graphic designer was out yesterday. <laughs> um, but yeah, they, they're ready to push everything else. I would say within the, with probably mid to end of next week at the latest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, 
Let's pivot back to the schedule. I've had a lot of questions about what happens on Wednesdays when the students aren't on campus. Um, other than mass, which will be live streamed, what else can parents expect from Wednesdays? And then on top of that, what can parents expect on the days that they're not on campus? Um, so the other three days of basically distance learning. It's a great question. Um, and, and I'll answer a little bit, but I think Ms. Cisneros would probably have better answers than me on this. So you can expect for your students to be attending mass on Wednesdays. Um, we are, we're also planning that on Wednesdays will be the day that the students will be watching some of their ancillary pre-recorded videos. Um, there will be a morning check-in. Um, we're still talking about circle time, all of those things, but on Wednesdays, the, the schedule will look very much like a normal school day schedule with a morning check-in, a story time, some circle time, then there'll be some time to get off the computer, uh, time to work on any ancillary class things, whether it be an art um, assignment or, or a song for the students to listen to or something along those ways. And then I think there's an afternoon check-in and um, there's, there's still, we've, we've still got the schedule set up that you're still, your children will still um, have a break for lunch We'll encourage them to play outside or to play in a playroom for a little bit, um, to take a rest, to have some nap time and then some afternoon story time and, um, and then just some kind of closing activities. Is the, uh, activities. That's, um, that's what our Wednesdays will look like. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Ms. Cisneros add to that. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, on the return to learning packet that uh, Dr. Ms. Martinez shared last week, um, you will find a schedule, a bell to bell schedule. So um, if you have any old any students in grades one through eight, um, I would advise that you look at it because what we work really hard on uh, doing is making sure that um, homeroom times and lunch times are the same across the board for students pre-K through eighth grade. So as you start as a parent, as you start planning for the day, uh, just know that the expectation is that at 8 a.m. your student is logged on wearing his St. Anne's shirt or her St. Anne's shirt um, at 8 a.m. with their teacher. At that moment, um, teachers will go ahead and make announcements, the pledge, they will take attendance, um, do check-ins on students. They vary across the board on how teachers are doing it. Uh, but at eight o'clock is when it starts. Um, when you, if you see periods one and two, we've given teachers um, time for them to kind of control what they want to teach during that time. During next week's um, teacher, uh, teacher parent orientations, they will go into detail and they will tell you uh, when is nap time, when is ELA happening and all that um, information. From 11 to 12 p.m., uh, that is lunch and recess time. Um, if you are doing remote learning, you want to go ahead and get your kids in a schedule and train them to eat and have like a 30 minute recess during 11 and 12. Um, periods three through five, um, a lot of what's happening, it's a lot of center time, nap times, and again, snack time, and it varies uh, from school, from teacher to teacher. Every day, your kids will have 30 minutes of ancillaries. Um, on Wednesday, it is a remote learning a schedule and the teachers are working on a specific schedule, how that's going to work. Um, but if, uh, next week, if you have specific questions about what your child is going to be doing at what time, um, just wait for the teachers to be able to give you those details. Thank you. I'm going to scroll back up. Um, we had a lot of um, questions that um, Nurse Engler is, is on the line with us, and I wonder if she would, wouldn't mind unmuting um, and answering a few of these questions. Um, one in particular from the Plaza family, how will COVID cases in the school be communicated to the, to the community as they, as they come up and hopefully they won't? <laughs> Exactly. We're hoping not to have any cases. Ms. Martinez will communicate those to the community. Um, if we have to close a particular classroom, and that's the purpose of cohorting, is so the whole school does not have to close down, then, we'll, then it will be me that will get in touch. I will send an email out to the parents. Okay. 
Um, and along the same lines, um, as far as masks and from a teacher, staff, faculty perspective, um, can you give us a little insight as to what, what we plan uh, as a campus-wide um, policy for, for staff and faculty? Sure. So the students um, will not be required to wear masks or shields. However, for those parents who feel that they want their students to have a shield on, that's going to be fine for them to do so. Um, the teachers will be wearing a mask uh, or a shield in, during the classroom. Okay. Uh, one question was, if they wear the face shield, will they be required to wear a mask with the face shield? Well, the medical community recommends that you wear a face shield and a mask both. Okay. So we will encourage that on campus. Um, as far as the classrooms and how they're set up um, for safety, um, can you describe a little bit of, um, in particular, our HVAC systems and how we'll organize traffic flow patterns and um, entryways, et cetera, signage on campus? Sure. We're going to have the parents uh, walk their kids to the gate. And at the gate, we're going to take an infrared thermometer reading where we'll just hold the thermometer up to their forehead. So you might want to prepare the kids that we're going to do that. Um, and then we're going to walk the children to the classroom. Each classroom will use the same door all day long so that if we do have to isolate, it'll just be that cohort that had, has to isolate. Then before the children go into the classroom, we're going to use hand sanitizer to be sure that their uh, hands are clean before they go in. And then inside of the classroom, we have special uh, acrylic type shields that will be around the desk that will protect the students um, so that they won't be sharing germs. Uh, we have a special hand washing video that has been made by the upperclassmen that they'll be seeing probably daily for a while until they get used to it. Um, and it's just gonna teach them how to wash their hands and how to use hand sanitizer. So they will be socially distanced. The medical community recommends six feet apart for the young children. And they'll have plenty of time to be outside, play on the playground. Uh, we won't be res restricting the playground equipment at all. But we'll try to keep them as socially distanced as possible. That's going to be difficult with young kids, but we'll do the best we can. And in terms of ventilation, we'll have windows and doors open to increase cross flows um, and mm -hmm. to keep the, the classrooms um, well ventilated. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah. Um, a, a big question is um, on the school calendar. If, will it be adjusted in any way um, because of, of the late start? And I, I think I can answer that, and that's, a, and that's a no, right? We're actually starting on time by beginning school activities the week of the 17th. Um, and that was done strategically so that we don't have to push the, the end date further out. Ms. Martinez? That's correct. Okay. Um, go ahead, sorry. Oh, I just wanted to add um, to something Ms. Englert said when she was talking about um, the masks for um, masks or face shields for early childhood students. You, you've already seen that we are not requiring, requiring them. I do want you to know that we are encouraging it. And so if, if families begin to work with their children to get used to wearing their, their masks or their shields, that is going to be a-okay. Um, we, we would rather the students have the masks or the shields on for their safety around one another and around the teachers, but it's it, at this level, it's not going to be something that a student is not allowed to come to school or something like that without the mask. But we are going to encourage both the masks and the shields. And that's really, um, I, I would say, even a 
bigger encouragement during center time and um, and recess time that they have something on. Uh, Miss Mitchell shared with me yesterday, she and Miss Lofton have some ideas um, with some hula hoops to help keep our students socially distanced at some of the areas in the classroom and some of the areas outside that there will only be, you know, so many people allowed in this area. And so we're definitely going to encourage that. But I did just want you all to know I've seen a lot of questions from parents. How do we feel about it? We would rather students have their masks and their shields on just to keep themselves safe and to keep our faculty and staff safe. But if you're not comfortable with that for the little kids, that's an option at, at that point. Only through um, kindergarten though. Okay. I've seen several questions um, from parents asking if they can attend the first two weeks of school in person and then begin distance learning or remote learning uh, on September the 8th. So begin in the classroom starting August the 24th and then opt out to distance learning on September the 8th. Sure. Yeah, I don't think that'll be a problem at all. We're, we're, we're a okay with that. I think that the important thing is you'll need to let Miss Cole know if you're doing that because our cohort size is already based upon those students who are not um, obviously, if, if you had signed up for distance learning, we don't have you in that cohort. So if that's something that you are looking to do, um, please get in contact with Ms. Cole today so that, so that we can see if we've got enough room to handle um, all of those students. That was part of the, um, the reasoning behind the cohort was to try to keep those as, as small as possible. But we can certainly look into that and see if we can help you with that. One, one thing I will um, share <clears throat> is um, the, the early childhood teachers, you, you are going to have a virtual orientation. Um, that is certainly something for all of you to attend. The early childhood teachers are also working on a schedule that will have st a student and a parent come in for just a 15 minute get to know the teacher, get to see the classroom. It'll just be um, one parent, one student, and the teacher at that time. So they're working on that schedule right now. It'll be a sign up genius that you will get to choose the time, uh, you know, that works best for you. But they, the early childhood teachers, and, and I have to just brag on them for a minute, it's such an incredible group of educators. But one of the things I've really found about them is that they are working so hard to find a way that respects, obviously, your concerns about your children's safety, their concerns about their own safety, but also really um, continues to, to impress upon the importance of face-to-face -face education. So um, they're working on those days to kind of say, you just come in uh, with your little guy for a few minutes and come meet me and come see the classroom so that this isn't all such a shock to you on the first day, especially because once school starts, we're not gonna be able to have parents in the classroom. And that is so outside of St. Anne's comfort zone. Um, so we really wanna make sure that we offer you all as parents and the children that time to meet the teacher. So we'll have more information on that out for you um, probably later this week. But again, you, you'll have the opportunity to sign up for a time that works for you. Can you talk a little bit about the scheduling since a lot of our families have early childhood students and elementary students um, and with a drop off at beginning at 745 and a pickup, you know, at 245 that kind of um, interrupts our, the our elementary school day. Can you tell us what we can expect? Yeah, and actually, I'm so thankful to the parent who, I can't remember who it was, but somebody pointed it out to me yesterday, and thank you, because we, um, we're we still trying to figure all of this out as well, and so that was, um, I never even thought of that, and it was, a, it was a great reminder to us yesterday. We're actually going to, we haven't had a chance to talk about it since we learned about it, but I'm going to talk with Missy Snados later today, and we're going to work on making some adjustments, so there'll be a little bit of flexibility 
flexibility at um, what time we start. We may, um, we may tweak the schedule just a little bit to give you guys a little bit more time to get everybody dropped off and um, to get your ones that are at home settled. And then we'll probably end a little bit early on the distance learning side for the elementary and middle school students so that you can come and, and pick up your child. So um, again, thank you for, for pointing that out to us. We, we forget that we haven't learned, we've learned so many things in these last few months, but we have not learned how to divide ourselves and be in two places at the same time. So we'll, we'll work on that in the next couple of days. I would imagine though, um, we're going to have quite a bit of flexibility on our part that if your, um, if your student is not logged in right at 8 a.m., we'll, we'll make some concessions and we'll, we'll figure it out. Ms. Cisneros? Um, the good thing is that um, teachers are very flexible. So as soon as we give it to the teachers, um, if the morning meeting is a hard one, we can tell them to easily move into like an afternoon meeting or a midday meeting. So it can fit all of you guys. So it'll be case by case basis, but we'll, I'll make sure to relate um, this information to the teachers so they can start thinking about a plan. Ms. Cisneros, since I have you on, um, some questions on what kind of technology do our early childhood um, families need to access um, Google sites and what uh, remote learning. Yes. Um, for right now, if your child can have an iPad or a Chromebook, that's okay. Um, um, we're, we, what we are going to use is Zoom for any virtual um, 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 learning with your teachers. It's going to be Zoom. And then the teachers are going to decide what apps and other things they want to use. Again, they vary from, from grade to grade. Um, teachers to teachers. So to get that information, just um, wait to talk to your teachers. But for right now, in terms of technology, um, as long as you have an iPad or a Chromebook or a laptop, any of those will work, whatever is comfortable for your student. And, and Ms. Cisneros and Ms. Martinez, um, along the same lines, how much time can parents expect to be online when they're remote learning? Did you hear? Yes, okay. so for right now, um, teachers are trying to make sure that it's no longer than an hour in remote learning. Uh, but again, what they're going to do is, because they're going to be balancing both remote and face-to-face -face learning these first two weeks, they're going to go ahead and they're going to have to work on it. And then they're gonna be talking to you in terms of how this works out. Uh, because I do want you to, you know, they're planning two different platforms right now. So um, we, we know, like Ms. Martina said, what we want for early childhood kids is the face-to-face -face experience. And um, it's very difficult to have little ones on the computer a very long time. Um, so you'll get more information on that as soon as teachers um, talk to you next week in terms of how, um, how to help your child during that one hour. Hopefully that's the, the max time. I'm gonna go to Nurse Englert now, and I've seen a lot of questions about health um, and safety. Um, and, and a parent wanted to know particularly at, when our little ones get sick with runny noses or coughs or whatnot, how will that be addressed on a, on a daily basis? How strict will the symptoms be uh, monitored or what would be the reaction on behalf of the school and communication to parents? Well, as you all are aware right now, the numbers in Houston are still very high. So uh, we have to be very meticulous about monitoring the kids. If your child is um, having allergies, perhaps it's a good idea for them to wear a mask so that they're not coughing on the other children. And we'll emphasize good uh, procedures for having them cough into their elbow. There's actually going to be signs posted on how to cough. Um, but we probably will ask you for a letter from your physician if your child has allergies, because as you all know, those are some, sometimes the first symptoms that may appear for COVID. So we'll be very cautious about that, but we'll work with you on it. And if we have a positive case in the classroom, can you um, describe the procedures that the school will take? Yes, um, I will be happy to. Um, we will have to close that classroom down right away in the middle of the day. We also have to contact the health department. So you'll be hearing from us immediately if we have a case of COVID within the classroom. Now I have taken the contact train, uh, training course 
And we don't, you only have to close down for contacts of contacts. You don't have to close down for the second and third generation. So unless there's an actual case where the child has COVID in the classroom, we don't have to close the classroom. Okay. Let's see. I, I, I had a question about um, the design of masks, which I think is, is pretty fun because we want to make sure that the kiddos have kid-friendly masks. But at the same time, because we're a Catholic school, we don't want um, any offensive language or, um, it, you know, keeping along the same lines as what you would wear to, to church. If you would wear it to church, you could probably, you can wear it to school. W would you agree, Mrs. Martinez? <clears throat> okay. Once assigned to a cohort group, will they stay with that group once all the students return to school? I think we pretty much answered that question in saying that the cohorts will hopefully be um, reunited back on campus after September the 8th, as long as it's socially distant uh, and appropriate to do so. Um, let's see. Can you please clarify the answer for elementary early childhood start time? We won't be dinged for tardiness. Um, and that's correct. Mrs. Cisneros suggested um, speaking um, that she'll convey the information to early childhood teachers who will be able to modify their class times um, based on that cohort um, and will be as flexible as possible. If you can't make the morning meetings or the morning announcements, luckily they'll be recorded and posted on the distance learning page and then you can, you can um, follow that along with your child in your house um, at your, at your um, a time convenient for you. Um, let's see, there are a lot of questions, but I feel like a lot of them have been answered. Um, if we keep our child home just in case with a runny nose, can we let them log in virtually so they don't miss that day? And absolutely, everything will be available on the Google Classroom site. Um, that the teachers created, similar to what we experienced in March, but for our new families, there's a Google Classroom site that has learning resources, um, assignments, links to other um, websites that are used within the classroom and that the teachers um, agree that are helpful and beneficial to the students while they're learning uh, in, the, in their homes. Um, we decided, let's see, can we expect a normal program at St. Anne during the second quarter? I really hope so. I think that is, you know, our, our, like, our goal. I think that's the goal for every single school that we return to some sense of normalcy, but I don't, I don't know it will be the normal that we've known in past years. And it, I, I think it, we can all agree that it'll be a new normal. Uh, Mrs. Martinez, do you want to take on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I certainly hope, I, my hope is that by October, um, all of our students are able to return to a five day a week uh, in-person learning environment. I just don't know if that's, uh, you know, if that's going to be where we are. I think in terms of, in case that is not what is able to happen, we want to make sure that we have a program that really works well uh, for, for whatever those circumstances may be. And I'm, you know, I'm reminded, actually, I, I see Mary Wolf on this call and uh, her husband Keith shared a quote with me last year that has really stuck with me. And it was about the, uh, how plans are often not very helpful, but the the importance of planning. And I feel like that's exactly what um, the, the attitude we've taken through all of this is that we have, we have gone through variations and ideations of, of hundreds of plans, but it's the actual um, work of doing the planning that has helped us get to this point and really helps us get to a point um, that'll get us through the entire school year with great learning if we are not able to, to get back. But I really do feel strongly um, that the numbers are going to be what, what 
guides us in all of this. And we have to be realistic about that, that if the numbers, um, the vaccine, if any of those things, um, if it all falls into place and it's great, then we wanna be back on campus. And we want all of our students here back on campus as well. Um, but if that's not what's safe for everybody, then we'll have to continue working with whatever programs uh, we do. And I think the, you know, maybe the good news in all of this, because I really have worked hard to try to find the silver lining, and I know that our entire faculty and staff have done the same. We are able to make some changes that we feel like are for the best of education and that maybe tradition has kept us from making, um, but we're, we're really going out there and saying, okay, now's the time to do it. And at the same time, really figuring out what is the best way to educate children and and some of, the, some of it worked within the old system that we had, and some of it we're learning that a new system is going to work a lot better. So we're trying to find the best in all of those. I asked Nurse Englert this particular question because it is a little bit confusing and overwhelming, um, but I have, for instance, have three kids on campus. If one of my students gets sick, um, will the other two um, be able to go to school? How does that how does that work if we're coming? From no, absolutely not. If you have a case of COVID in your household, all family members must quarantine for 14 days and five days after exposure, you need to go have a COVID test for the other members of your family so you'll know if anyone else has it. But all family members must quarantine for 14 days. Now that should not impact the classroom if the child that is in that classroom does not have COVID. What is the case count and that, or the community transmission metric that St. Anne is using um, as a go, no go point for returning to full in classroom learning? And I, I think, um, Mr. Hall, that there's several factors that Nurse Engler and Mrs. Martinez can, can speak on. It's not just a one, one answered um, directive. Nurse Engler, do you want to speak on that? Uh, yeah, we're looking at um, the 14-day the average. Um, we're looking at the total numbers. Um, we're looking at what the health authorities are recommending. Um, Ms. Martinez, do you have anything to add to that? I, I would just say we don't have a hard and, and fast number um, at this point. In, it, in the game of it. What we have been doing is really taking the advice of several medical professionals, uh, both parents, some of them who are on this call, and we're so thankful to them who have been giving us advice. We're also very blessed. Dr. Purse is a, um, his daughter is an alum of St. Anne's, and so he has been wonderful in kind of helping us walk through this as well. So at this point, we do not have a hard and, and fast number. And, and and I would say part of that is I don't I don't know that we could all agree on one uh, to to begin with. My my personal preference is probably very different than than some other people. So right now we're just kind of going through the system and making sure that our plans work for for whatever wherever that number falls for right now. I think uh, you know we've had a lot of people ask uh, what about if the city. Uh, you know, puts us back on. Well, the city already has put us back on. And so at this point, all we can do is really just come up with a plan that allows us to work safely within those guidelines. And I do want to add to that, excuse me. Sure. I do want to add to that, that whenever there is a case um, anywhere in the city, well, the health department does get involved. So they will know whatever is going on and they also make recommendations. And, and just to clarify quickly, because we know our little ones, they have random fevers, teeth, stomach aches, et cetera. If a child is exhibiting a fever, what, will, what steps will you take? If a child has a fever of 100 or greater, they must go home. And we would recommend that you go ahead and check in with your primary physician and uh, do whatever is recommended at that point. It may be indicated to go ahead and do a COVID test. Okay. 
We've gone through majority of the questions. I know there's some super specific ones and um, because this is saved, we'll be able to um, reach out to you privately um, because they are more individual based. But are there, are there any other more generic questions, things that we didn't cover, any other um, pressing items that or concerns that you have? Know that um, we'll be sending another document out. It's the return to learning um, plan two. Um, as we make the transition to bring everyone on campus because policies and procedures will change a little bit as we try to bring everyone back on from um, carpool procedures to um, ancillary classes, et cetera. So we'll be updating you again in the coming weeks um, once we solidify that, that program. Um, if I can, Ms. Aleman, I just want to share, you know, we, we've talked so much about um, some of the reactions that, that we're having to do to COVID. I want to share with you, um, and maybe this is a, a good way to kind of wrap this up. I want to share with you some of the, some of the exciting things um, that have been happening on campus and that we're excited about for this 20. 2021 school year. Um, it's so easy to get overshadowed by COVID, but a few of the things I want to share with you. Um, we're very excited. We are moving into our um, gym space today, so that is some great news. Our PE teachers are beginning to move their things in. We have a, um, a special room, especially for early childhood physical education. It's called the studio. Um, it is a great space that is large enough for our early childhood students without some of the overwhelmingness of the big part of the gym. Uh, so we're excited about that. They're finishing up our fields. Uh, if the rain ever stops, we will hopefully be ready to go with those. Um, our new parking garage is finished, which will hopefully make your jobs a whole lot easier as you're dropping off your children. Some of the great curriculum things that we've done over the summer, uh, we are moving to a program called Clever. And Clever is going to allow you to be a one-stop spot for all of the access you need to any of your, not just distance learning, but anything that you're working on from home. It takes care of all your passwords. Uh, it, it's a great program. The teachers are gonna be trying out Seesaw uh, for the next few weeks to see if we want to move early childhood to the Seesaw platform. Um, we're really excited about some of the great programs that Seesaw has in there as well. Um, we've upgraded, uh, we've got some new playground equipment on the way for our early childhood students. Uh, we are going to be covering up the sandbox for a period of time. We don't know yet if that'll be permanent. So the children will have some great, fun outdoor eating space uh, for them to have picnics in and uh, things like that. So we're really excited about some of the really cool things that are happening on campus. And, and I want to make sure you know those too. Um, we have spent so much time making sure that we have a great um, systematic response to COVID. And without the hard work of all of our faculty and staff, uh, but especially Nurse Englert and Miss Aleman and Miss Cole, Miss Cisneros, Miss Goodman, our counselor, who has been working on some great social emotional learning, um, not just for some trauma response, but also for how to help our kids be great 21st century people in there. And then Mr. Rivero as well, um, who's been handling the technology aspect of all of it. We're really excited um, about what we have to offer you as a campus, whether we're in person or not. So we're really excited about what the next few months are going to bring to St. Anne's, um, even, even with COVID looming in the background on us. I'm gonna um, just throw out one more question before we wrap things up and I will try to um, create an FAQ for this um, if, I, if I can, but know that it'll be possible to review the video on facts to get um, answers uh, to your questions and whatnot. And also that any one of us on the administrative team are available and can respond to your emails relatively quick, quickly as well. Um, but this was a great question from Ms. James, and she wanted to know what the benefit of parking in the drive and then walking in our children for morning drop-off. 
Um, and then just speaking personally, I can say that if I had a pre-K three student, I really don't want them entering the campus on the first day of school without holding my hand. Um, so, so we created a modified system for those first two weeks um, so that they know it, they're coming to a safe environment um, and that their first impression of St. Anne isn't that they're masked. Um, they're going to, to an adult or an, uh, a teacher with a mask on or a shield on. I, can, I just can't imagine how, um, what kind of an image that, that would be for a three-year-old. But Mrs. Martinez, can you describe um, a little bit as to why and how we came up to this program or this procedure for the first two weeks? Sure. Um, so when we when we took everything into consideration and remember going back to that safety was the importance of our driver and having a face to face program. I will say I think we took some of the wisdom and best pra practices of the um, of our Catholic schools that have been able to run a summer school program. We took some of the wisdom. Um, Ms. Cole uh, has had to has been sending her boys to their daycare center. And so we really took a look at that. And we took a look at what some of the other schools around us who have had the experience of having early childhood kids in person on campus and tried to make a plan uh, that took us from there. How do we do this safely, but at the same time really honor the importance of a face-to-face -face experience for children and for their parents and for their teachers as well. So um, hopefully we've been able, I, I think we've done an incredible job of balancing all three of those, uh, but we know that we want to we want to be able to give it some time to make sure we feel good about how this works and to address any concerns that either the children have or you as the parents have or anything that the teacher has as well. And with that, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, it's 1030. I asked for an hour of your time, and I know you're incredibly busy um, balancing work and, and your children at home. So thank you for joining us. Know that you can expect um, more town halls in the future, because I think this is a great way for us to all be connected and to have your um, questions answered. Um, so we'll be scheduling some more um, in the next few weeks, as well as parent orientations um, and then invitations for on-campus um, visits. Um, so. Uh, like I said earlier, if you have any questions, anyone on our administrative team is available to answer your calls. Um, thank you so much for visiting with us and I hope you have a blessed day.